his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. And we do gather here this morning uh, very much focused on praising and worshipping our God together. Well, good morning and uh, welcome to you today. I did hear that it's just kind of rather autumnal um, this morning, a little bit <laughs> chilly um, today, but we are guaranteed to have a warm time of worship and praise together this morning, and it's going to be fantastic. Well, it's been a week out now, um, but let me ask you this. Is anyone else missing the Olympics on TV? Yeah, raise, raise eyes. I am. I, I am. I mean, I, I loved watching uh, all the sport um, there, and I'm, I'm sure you'd agree. There was some pretty amazing uh, performances uh, over these uh, 16 days of the Games, notwithstanding, obviously, the Australian breakdancer. But anyhow, a, a wee bit of, of trivia for you. Did you know that this year's Olympics in Paris actually had the least amount of world records broken than any other Olympics in recent history. Yep, it's true. There were fewer world records broken in Paris than in Tokyo, than in Rio, than in London, than in Beijing, in Athens. But that being said, one world record on the track which I saw really stuck in, in my mind. It was the women's uh, 400 meter hurdles. And the US uh, runner, uh, Sydney McLaughlin LeBron, blew away the competition and indeed her own world record in the process. But it was what Sydney said after the race that really grabbed my attention. You see, Sydney is a Christian, and when she was being interviewed, she witnessed, she told the, the watching world about God. She said this, she said, honestly, I praise God. I was not expecting that, but he can do anything. And she continued, she said, anything is possible in Christ. So yeah, I'm amazed, baffled, and in shock, she said. So guys, having just achieved an astonishing feat, this lady wanted all the glory, all the honor, all the praise to go to her Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know that a British diver, a lady, said something very similar on TV. Did you see that one? British girl, Scottish girl, I think so. She got bronze, yeah, yeah. But guys, it's, it's our God who supplies us with the strength, the bodies, the determination to achieve much in this life. But let's make sure that all the honor and praise doesn't fall upon our prideful hearts. Rather, let's heap their glory onto the God who is so kind to us. So we're going to begin our song praise by glorifying the Lord Jesus. We're going to sing together hymn number 378 in our mission praise books. Jesus shall take the highest honor.
Let's come before our Lord in prayer. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Dear Lord, we bow our heads this morning seeking to honor, to glorify, and to worship our great Redeemer and Savior. We come in adoration to the one true living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is our blessing and rich delight that we are found in your house on this day, and we rejoice that as sheep of your pasture, you have invited us to partake in the blessings of heaven and the resurrection life planned in eternity and secured on Calvary. So Lord Jesus, as our Prince and Savior, we would seek your presence in and amongst us. We desire that the friend of sinners would draw close and comfort your children this morning. Comfort us with the hope of the gospel and the promises of eternal salvation. Lord God, we bow down and we do acknowledge and recognize our sin. We know that aside from you, we would be utterly lost. We understand that you call us to a life of holiness and a life which speaks of your love, yet often we do not respond as we ought. And so we as sinners, free from bondage, lay hold of your and your all-sufficient grace. And we do so and we bring our, our dirty hands we draw them close to your nail-pierced hands. We whose hearts were black with sin come to you who washes us white as the driven soul. You are indeed our Savior, the one who was mocked and crucified and in whom the fullness of the Godhead was pleased to dwell and in whom we find our redemption. So Lord, send your Holy Spirit upon this house, we pray. Illuminate our souls that we might discern the things of God. Shine your light into our hearts that we may not only understand your word, but we also may respond in obedience. Lord, there are many in this world who do not know you, who are as yet estranged from the perfect love of a heavenly father. And so we plead for revival. We plead that you would move in this town and nation that a land would return to you and that a people whose hearts have grown cold might be inflamed once more for the gospel. Lord Jesus, hear our prayers, for we bring them to you in the beautiful words that you taught your church to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, can I invite the youngsters to head off to their Sunday school classes? Well, every church survey uh, consistently returns the same result. When pastors are asked which book of the Bible they are least likely to preach on, they reply, the book of Revelation. When congregations are asked which of the book of the Bible they would most like to hear taught, guess what? The book of Revelation is their enthusiastic response. Now, folks, we cannot escape the fact that the last book of the Bible presents the reader and preacher with a significant challenge. It's challenging to hear. It's full of vivid pictures and symbols. It's a challenging book to understand. Much of what we read is understood only through extensive knowledge of Old Testament imagery. It's a challenging book to apply to our daily life. Some of the teaching quite simply dumbfounds the reader. But, but, despite all the interpretive difficulties, we would do well to notice that the book of Revelation from the get-go promises profit to those who invest their time in it. 
In the very first chapter we read, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. So God promises blessings when we open and we study this book. Now it's true to say that there is gain in the reading of all scripture, but for whatever reason, God attaches a special blessing to the reading of the last book of the Bible. So, perhaps on this occasion, the congregation have got it right in wanting to hear this book taught, and the pastors have missed the mark in running a mile from teaching it. Now today, we are going to rectify that situation. We're going to begin a short study of the first three chapters of Revelation. We're going to investigate Jesus' last words in Scripture to the church. Now, I recall... Um, back when I worked in uh, financial services, uh, part of our training involved analyzing case studies and making recommendations. We'd be given information about a, a hypothetical family, their ages, employment, savings, pensions, etc. And from this info, we were tasked to analyze the family situation and make recommendations specific to their circumstances. Now, folks, in John's writings, we encounter something akin to case studies of different types of churches. We find varied difficulties needing specific responses. We meet churches who are complacent and have lost their first love, churches who tolerate sin in their midst, Churches who are holding fast to the gospel and churches that are lukewarm in their faith. Now Jesus in these letters identifies the issue, the problem, and then he provides the solution. Guys, Jesus loves his church. He died for his church. And these words, sometimes of rebuke, are given in the spirit of love. Beloved, rebuke, identifying areas in which we need spiritual reevaluation, is always to be carried out in a spirit of love. And this is what the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, isn't it? He says, I charge you to preach the word in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. So it's rebuke when necessary. So Christ, as the head of the church, will cast his eye over first century congregations and he will call out the practices that are not conducive to godly living and witness. Guys, sometimes we need experts to cast their eyes over how we are doing, don't we? Golfers, for example, they'll video their swing, they'll send it to a consultant who will analyze and advise Folks want to know how they can improve their game. And to do this, the performance needs to be honestly critiqued. So Jesus, because he loves his church and wants to see his church prosper, is similarly providing in these case studies a warts and all critique of their spiritual development. Now it's my prayer that in these next few weeks, Christ will show us as a church, how we may avoid the pitfalls besetting contemporary Christianity and set us on the path of progressing towards being both the individual believers and corporate congregation that the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to be. So we're going to read together from Revelation chapter 1. This is the word of the living God. John writes, The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, Grace to you and peace from him who is and wa who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, 
the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was in the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and in turning I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a fire furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, these that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Amen. We'll end our reading there this morning. Well, we're going to sing before we begin our study of uh, Revelation. And we're going to sing hymn number 44 in Mission Praise Books. It's at your feet, O Lord, will rise to sing.
Okay, so where do you get your news from? Your news? TV? Newspapers? Maybe apps on your phone? Guys, all of these options don't make the news. They're actually just the medium that transfers the information from the source, the journalist, to your home. Before we examine the news contained in the letters to the seven churches, we would do well to familiarize ourselves with the conduit, the link between the originator of these words and the churches that are to receive them. If you have with you today a King James version of the Bible, you would have found a reading under the title, The Revelation of St. John the Divine. Now, this title is not accurate. You see, the first words recorded in this book provide a better reflection upon its contents. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Guys, this is not John's revelation. It's Jesus' revelation to John and to us in the church. John is the conduit. Christ is the source. He is the author of this book. But that being said, we're going to spend today meeting John and considering how his life speaks to the Christian experience. Three headings. John is a saint, he's a sufferer, and he's a servant. So he's a saint. Verse 4 begins, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. Now the Bible is full of Johns. So which one is this? Well, this John is undoubtedly well known because he fails to specify exactly who he is in the letter's opening. This John is none other than the great apostle who had 60 plus years ago left his father's fishing business as a youth to follow Jesus. One day Jesus called him to follow and he did exactly that. On the shores of Galilee, John heard the call of Christ and he responded. Now note here, guys, that he left the family business that was his to inherit. He cast aside financial security. He disregarded his legacy all for the blessing of knowing and following Jesus. And that's the pattern, isn't it? It's a pattern then and it's a pattern now. Turn from the stuff that the world prizes and pursue the one who created the world, including you, and therefore knows where true satisfaction lies. But not only was John to become a faithful disciple of Jesus, but scripture tells us that he was one of the inner circle of Jesus' closest companions. He was on the snow-capped mountains of Hermon when Christ appeared in glory with Elijah and Moses. He was there when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He had laid his head on the Lord's breast at the Last Supper. He was the one whom Jesus entrusted his mother Mary to as he hung dying on the cross. He sprinted to the empty tomb with Peter in that first Easter morning, and he was known as the beloved disciple whom Jesus loved. John is one of the closest people in the world to Christ. He authored the Gospel of John. He wrote three letters in our New Testament in addition to the book we're now studying. John was solid in the faith. He outlived all the other apostles. He saw all his friends murdered, yet his faith never wavered. He was a saint of God. Now, when we look at all this, we probably think this guy is some kind of superhuman type figure. He's a legend. He's so different from us, isn't he? But look at how John addresses these churches to whom he writes. Verse 9, I join your brother and partner. John is humble. He's calling the folks to whom Jesus says some pretty strong things, brothers and partners. And this sounds similar to how Paul wrote, doesn't it? You ever read Philemon when Paul calls Onesimus, a runaway slave, his child? He calls Philemon his brother? Guys, there is no room in the body of Christ for haughty attitudes. There is no room for Christians who raise themselves up. All the saints are to do is to raise Christ up. John is a saint of God, and he's writing to saints of God. Beloved, if you're here today and you're a Christian, then the name's...